radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Well, 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 here we go. Friday night, Fade to Black. You know how many Friday nights we've done on Fade to Black in the last, this is 2024, so the last uh, 11 years? How many times have we done a Friday night show? Uh, Two, maybe? Three in 11 years, right? That's why Friday night on Fade to Black is so special. And it's happening tonight because of Jason Quit. Today is Friday, March 22nd, 2024. Circle that on your calendars, folks. We did a fade to black on Friday, March 22nd. And Jason Quit's new book is out. You can get it on Amazon. We have got the links. It's number one on Amazon. Uh, we've got the links up in the chat right now, so you can go and do it. Bill, John and Side, uh, re, re, repost it and stuff uh, throughout the show tonight and, and get everybody excited. We've also got the links up throughout social media. Uh, it is there, so you can go and find it. And there you go. All right? All right. Now, that's, uh, you know, I... I uh, I just just order it through Amazon so we can keep keep this thing at number one. All right, you can go to you can go to Jason's website if you want an autographed copy. All right, I'd get that later. All right, you can get that later. You're gonna you, you go to the Crystal Sun all the time. You'll see it right there. But go to Amazon. Let's keep this thing at number one. That's that's it. Just keep this thing at number one. I love it. I love it. So we're going to be talking about that tonight. And uh, let me just say this before I bring Jason on. Three-body problem. All right. Three-body problem. I'm five episodes in. I've got three more to go. And uh, and I posted. I, I, I'm telling. I, I and I was just texting with uh, a friend of mine. I can't say who who uh, this person is, but um, anyway, I just said <laughs> the same thing that I posted in in the chat. I'm in mild shock. I've got I've got PTSD. I've been hit in the head with a ball peen hammer. Uh, episodes four and five and now leading into this now it's an alien invasion series from a sci-fi book series three books chinese um produced and done by the team that did game of thrones um and the reviews of three body problem uh going into it i'd heard some chatter about it and i was like what's going on it, it, it released yesterday and so I go and I'm like, what's all the hype about? I'm reading these reviews. Greatest, greatest production in the history of mankind. What? How is that possible? Especially after we just did the 25th anniversary of the Matrix last night, right? Putting it up at that level, right? These reviews, it, you know, it, 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 it was impossible to make. There's no way, and it, it is, and it, it's perfect. And, it's, and I thought, what? Now, when critics like something that much, normally I check out. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait for the second round of reviews. Holy crap. So today, I'm going to bring Jason in. We've got a lot to talk about tonight. But today's my normal day off, as everybody knows. It's my Friday. So I didn't do the news today, and I had other stuff to do. And and I and I'm getting stuff done, and some parts uh, came in. Uh, for my Harley, I got the fade to black T-shirt shipped, and I'm you know just getting stuff done, and bolted a couple of things on my Harley. Kind of took a look back, and I'm like, okay, all right, I got the show tonight with Jason. Let me call Jason. Call Jason. 
and uh, getting things organized uh, for the presentation tonight. We're very excited that uh, the book is sitting where it is right now on Amazon and 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 uh, all of the hard work that he's put into it. And he's been a stress case. And 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 uh, so I go and <laughs> well, I got some spare time. I'm going to watch Three Body Problem. So I watched episodes four and five. Holy crap. No spoilers. It's an alien invasion TV series. All right? That's it. That's it. I'm just going to leave it right there. I didn't read anything about it. I didn't want to know anything about it. I just wanted to see if the hype the hype is there. It's It's, yes, yeah. And I've got three more episodes to get to immediately after the show tonight. So don't blow it for anybody in the chat or anything if you've already managed to binge it uh, between yesterday and today. But tonight, it's Jason Quid. His new book, Gates of the Anunnaki, is out. We've got the links for it, and it's up in social media. We've got it in the chat. You can head straight over to Amazon and get yourself a copy. And uh, tonight, we've got some images, and we're going to talk about the book and how how it came about, and all of that, and how his mind works. He is a graduate of the Institute of Energy Wellness and a student of the Algonquin shamanism and has been training and working with many teachers, shamans, and traditional healers from around the world. He's also the author of Astral Genesis, the Egyptian Postures of Power, Ancient Qigong System, and the Yosef Codes, Sacred Geometry Mandalas. His website, of course, is thecrystalsun.com. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only man. Did I hype him up enough? There he is right there, Jason Quit. Jason, how you doing, man? Are you relaxing now? Are You know, it's Friday. The book is out. Are you into re- are chamomile tea, right? Are, are, are you there? Uh, hojicha. <laughs> Need a good hojicha right now. Congrat- <laughs> Thank congratulations! You. Congratulations! Thank you. No, it's been. Um, I, I, my, I have not moved from this desk since December. I know. I think when I started, and when I do a project, it's um, I have a a one track mind. Everything in that else in the world is shut out. <laughs> I'm just right here at the desk working and um no it feels it feels real good that it's out i can't even believe it and you know after you work so hard on something it's like this whole week it's like what do i do with myself who am i <laughs> where do i go from here uh, it's one of those things yeah yeah and 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 you've earned it you know see that's that's the whole point you've earned it uh did writing a book and i joke about it all the time i just I don't know how I have just so much admiration for anybody that can get a book done, right? The beginning, the middle, the end, and get a public. That is, you know, and I just, I've got books in my head. I've started writing two, right? And you and I were talking about that the other day, right? We're talking about software and the processes and, and I'm like, Jason, what's the secret sauce, man? How do you do it? How do you get it done? Because I need that advice. I need, I, I, I need that, but you have that ability uh, to crank a book out. Now let's, let's pop this up. I'm very proud of this. There's the cover gates of the Anunnaki and um, getting a book done uh, can can I start with a story or should I start with a question? I've... Okay. Let's 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 start with a story. I wrote I wrote the foreword to the book. And uh and and I had an idea for the foreword to the book, which is uh, still in the foreword to the book. But but let's back up. Let's tell a little story. Let's tell let's give somebody the secret uh, behind the scenes thing about how a book gets done. Shall we do that? Shall of we course. start? Let's shall we that. start with that, Jason? Yes. Okay. So Jason and we've joked about it a lot over the years and especially over the last, over the last year, um, Jason calling me up and uh, doing a zoom call or whatever. 
and uh, Skype, and he's got those crazy eyes, right? And and he's looking at me, Jimmy. I discovered something. I'm like, oh man, here we go. Here we go. Okay. And it's not the bad here we go. It's it's I've got to get my brain ready because this is it's it's when when you when you're in that mode, and I can tell he's got his fuzzy slippers on, he hasn't changed his shirt in three days, he's 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 ripe, <laughs> you know, he hasn't left the office. I can tell, I can tell that's what you know, and you're into the research and you've made a discovery. Well, okay. So, and that's what we went through with um, uh, uh, Astro. And it's, it's, it's a funny story. So anyway, Astro Genesis comes out and everything's cool. And, you know, and, and Jason and I are talking and we did a conference and, and we did some stuff. And we're hanging out. We're doing our thing, right? Everything's, everything's fine. So Jason, everybody, calls me up and we're talking uh, about stuff. About, you know, a little bit about astral genesis, but just things. And we're talking about us and humanity and we're, you know, we're getting some philosophy in and some science in and deep history. Just a basic fun conversation. All right. All right. Um, and then I say, wait a minute. That reminds me of the 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 seven gates temple in egypt and karnak and jason goes what <laughs> right 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 you got to confirm the story jason uh, have yes. i embellished anything yet nothing at all this is exactly nothing at how all. the story this is, goes this is, this is how it goes and and jason goes what i go man i, I i've got a picture of it so I pull it up on my phone and uh I might have texted it to you uh or I emailed, emailed. it to you yeah. right right and and J- and I watched it happen in real time the wheels Jason can look at something and see through it I he's you know and everybody interprets things differently and that's fine right but Jason right so he's looking at this and it's in the middle of this long conversation that we were having on the phone. And, and then we continue talking. And I said to Jason, again, I'm not embellishing. I go, dude, we've got a book here. And Jason goes, we do. And I said, let's, let's write a book together. Jason goes, yes. And now at that point, now we have both agreed we're, we're going to do this book. And I'm thinking, you know, we had this long conversation, but we both knew that there was a book here. There was a book here, right? Okay. So everybody, this is what happened. I hang up the phone after we talked for a couple of hours. It was about, it wasn't very long. I'm going to say... Two weeks. It might have been a week, but let's. I'm going to be. I'm going to give it a little cushion here, and I'm going to say two weeks later, I get a text from Jason, and the text reads. And I could, re- Jason. I could show everybody the friggin' text right now. Yeah. The text reads, "I've got the chapter list done." I'm like, "What, dude? I haven't had a chance to. You've got the chapter list done." And then I sat back and I went, he's got the book written. He's got it already laid out. He knows. And I just, I sat back and I smiled. I was upset for a minute that I was no longer the (laughs) co-author, which was the whole plan. But I, I, I just knew, I knew you couldn't stop. And the picture that I'm talking about is this one right here. That's uh, the Temple of the Seven Gates in Karnak. This was taken on my birthday. And this is a Stargate uh, temple in the middle of Karnak. It's uh, it's very exclusive, hard to get to. Jason Mm -hmm. uh, hadn't even uh, known about it. I hadn't known about it. It was a gift for my birthday. And you can see the seven gates. Now, we're going to get into this later on tonight. But this picture and that conversation that day is what inspired the book. And uh, Jason, congratulations. And it's just amazing how your mind works, how something so simple 
a conversation between friends and and then suddenly the inspiration hits and you line everything up you connected the dots my man yeah you, you we had to talk because <laughs> i i'm in the same situation that i was in um two years ago astrogenesis yeah. astrogenesis because um you know i have this book which is basically um my foundational work which is the uh, egyptian postures of power which goes into mysticism movements and things and and there's there's two books right and it's like i could i can't finish the second book of it because every time i start working on that second book something that i'm writing in that second book hits me and i need to step back <laughs> so this is when when I called you about the, that conversation, because um, I'm writing the salute to the moon. It's about the moon, right? So obviously I'm doing my research. I'm going into ancient history and I'm looking and I'm basically studying and reading all about the ancient moon gods. And um, one of the most ancient moon gods um, comes from Samaria and his name is Nana. So Nana, and he's he's known later in um, in later uh, Azarian and Babylonian times as the god Sin, and but in Sumerian times he was known as Nana. He was the moon god, and there's a hymn um, that's written. It's very old. It's it's almost um, forty five hundred years old, and it it talks about the moon and he's a, a shepherd and he has cattle pens in heaven and he starts describing these cattle pens and and how many cattles are in each pen and he's he's numbering all these different cattle of what he has and as i'm i'm reading this story and i'm reading the numbers i see the numbers and i'm like i know these numbers the, this is a sequence of numbers that has nothing to do with cattle and pens this is something um a numbering system and the sumerians are known for their numbering systems they basically created the numbering systems but these are very specific numbers and so i kind of in the moon book i wrote this is very interesting and i'm sure there's something more to this <laughs> and um basically um i call you up and I start doing more research and I start going into, okay, well, can I find this numbering sequence in other places? Because I know what this is. You, you mentioned earlier, I wrote a book called the Yosef codes, right? The original Yosef codes was um, just a deck of cards. And like, I, I made these like mandalas using sacred geometry and the way I made these mandalas was using a numbering system. And the numbering system I used was based on the flower of life. Okay. And what I did was I took the, the number values that come out of the flower of life, as you can kind of see how crazy I was even back then, you know, I was kind of nuts back then. <laughs> so basically I took the numbering system of the flower of life and it create when you added them together, subtracted them, multiplied them together. It was like the secrets of three, six, nine, just like Nikola Tesla spoke about. And those numbers were very, very specific. And it was like a repeating numbering system. And that were, that was the numbers that was in the, the hymn or the herds of Nana hymn going back almost 5,000 years ago. I'm saying, wait a second, this is, this is crazy. This is something is more to this. Um, so then I start looking deeper and I start looking at, uh, it's ac actually, um, it's kind of funny because when I go on YouTube, I get advertising for Gaia. Okay. <laughs> and for the longest time I would get these ads with, uh, Johnny Enoch coming on my screen and, you know, Johnny Enoch's voice. And he's the first thing he says is something about the Sumerian Kings list and the Sumerian King list, you know, goes back, you know, to the pre flood, uh, going back over 200,000 years. Right. And it lists the Kings. So I go and I look at the Kings list 
the pre-Diluvian kings list. And I'm looking at the numbers of the reigns of the kings, of the eight kingdoms, or no, it's the five kingdoms and the eight kings. And I'm looking at the numbers, and it's the same numbers. So it's the same numbers from the flower of life numbering sequence. It's the same numbers from the herds of Nana. And I'm like, okay, so now there's something more to this. And then I go and I look into um, the greatest epic of Sumerian times, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And I'm thinking, this can't be in the Epic of Gilgamesh too. And I'm going through the Epic of Gilgamesh, and we come to um, the part where they talk about um, basically the character who is uh, the modern day Noah, but you know, uh, prior to Noah, about a couple or about a thousand years prior to Noah, and um, Enki is giving uh, this individual instructions on how to build the ark. And then when you take those numbers on how to build the ark, it creates a sacred geometry. Um, it's, it's a sacred geometry cube. And all the and numbers that, he lists is, is in there. Okay, let me, let me I'm just continue. This is yes. the cube the, that's, that he's that's, referring to. Yes, and those are some of the numbers that, that come from that cube. And he's talking about building an ark, you know, to save humanity from the great flood. And if you put this in the ocean, if you put this in flood water, it will basically kill everything inside. The The waves would just topple it over. It has, There's no, this is not made for, um, water. So obviously he's giving instructions to something else. So it's an allegory to something else. So this is what we're basically exploring is a, is a sacred numbering system that is found going back to um, not only ancient Samaria, but it, it predates Samaria. So uh, in the book, we started to the Neolithic um, and continue forward of the different tribes that are found in the Neolithic. Um, even, you know, asking questions, did they come from uh, ancient Anatolia, which is, you know, Gobekli Tepe, which is goes back to the last ice age. But when it comes to the conversation that Jimmy and I had um, about the seven gates, when he showed me the picture of the seven gates, this is how it all kind of was brought together. Uh, when he showed me the pictures of the seven gates, I said to Jimmy, do you know that that's on the temple of Karnak in Egypt, but two, 3,000 years before Karnak was built, this was a symbol from ancient Samaria. In fact, there's um, if you go back and look at the eye the idol tablet of Urk, or the eye idol tablet of Ur, that is 5,500 years old that tablet 5,500 years old predates Egypt and it shows um, a gate um, and with two eyes on it. And they don't know what these things are. I mean, these are, these are images and symbols that are still undefined by modern historians. And these are gates. And then I said to Jimmy, did you, do you know the story of the descent of Inanna? Inanna is later um, is Ishtar. And when you look at the story of, or the descent of Inanna, one of the main themes in that story is her traveling down. Uh, yeah, so Inanna is uh, the Anunnaki, part of the Anunnaki. Right here. Anunnaki, right, right here. Goddess of fertility, love, and war. She's also the morning star, uh, Venus. And her brother is Utu, which is the sun god. And these are the Anunnaki. And I know there's a lot of, um, especially in this community, when you bring up the word Anunnaki, um, it, immediately people go to Zachariah Stitchin, they go to the ancient gods, and they go to, uh, those are the, the beings that created mankind. And please read the ancient tablets. You'll get a very different story. Yeah, okay. and, and now, and and this is also a part of. I don't want the audience to understand. This is part of the conversation, which was very colorful because I have my take on things, 
There is a literal academic take on things. There's Jason's uh, research take on things and others that are there. And so Jason and I, we, we push back and forth on this. And that doesn't change the age or the age of the Kings list or the years uh, and, and what we are talking about here. But there are so many different ways to interpret. But you need to look 3D through these stories and look at this to come to uh, your own um, resolutions. And, and Jason has done that. So I needed to put that in there. It's not like I agreed with Jason, and which no. is why we decided to write the book together. That was the other thing, right? It was uh, two different things. Anyway, so uh, please continue. Uh, so this is Anana here. Yes. Everybody can see there's Enlil. There's Enki, okay, uh, the god of air, the god of water. Uh, Nana, the god of the moon. Okay, and so this is the gods and how they are related to each other. Yes, and, um, you know, when we say the words Anunnaki, um, Anu is the god of the sky. It's like the supreme god. It's almost like um, uh, Ra from Egypt. Okay, so that's, that's Anu. And Ki is the goddess of the earth, right? So it's heaven and earth, Anu and Ki. So when we say the Anunnaki, what we're actually saying is the children of Anu and Ki. So it's the children of heaven and earth or the gods of heaven and earth. And um, so that's just um, what I wanted to, to put out there. But, okay, so Inanna, who is an Anunnaki, she's the great granddaughter of Anu and Ki. Um, she goes down into the underworld um, to go to attend uh, her sister's husband's funeral, the Bull of Heaven. And the Bull of Heaven is something, is a title that is found in many ancient texts. And so this is where we start talking, Jimmy and I. And I said, when Inanna gets down to the underworld, and this is a very ancient story, um, to get into the underworld, she has to pass through seven gates. And as she passes through seven gates, at each gate, she has to take off an item of her clothing uh, or give up jewelry so that when she enters the underworld, she's basically um, naked and bowed down to the goddess of the underworld, which is her sister. And this is one of the most ancient versions of the descent into the underworld. And this is the basis story. This is before the, um, the Book of Gates in Egypt. Um, so this predates Egypt, and but the symbols of these gates um, are found in ancient Samaria going back at least 5,000 5, or 5,500 years ago. So this is how the, the conversation with Jimmy uh, progressed, was I was trying to, to show him that there's these symbols of the seven gates. And then I said, um, we have to look at this also in the mystical terms, because there's so many levels of uh, symbology here of what these gates actually mean. And for one, it's the gates of the underworld as if the sun has to pass through the night sky and the constellations. That's one interpretation of going into the underworld. The seven gates is also, um, if you study ancient mysticisms, the seven gates is the portals of your head, <laughs> of their physical body. So you have seven portals, which is your two ears, two eyes, two nostrils, and one mouth. These are the portals of your world. And uh, when you study mysticism, um, there is, it's a mirror, there's like two sides. So you have the physical senses, which are seven. Uh, you have the physical portals, which are seven. And then you have the mystical portals that are unseen, which are seven. And New Age, you know, we talk about the seven chakras, um, in ancient times, um, seven was extremely important. The seven gates were uh, the seven planetary spheres. Um, it was also the uh, Big Dipper, seven stars of the Big Dipper pointing to Octarius star. So there's all these mystical interpretations of what these gates 
represent. And, and, and so with these yes. uh, seven gates in, in the photograph, then I show Jason the picture, which I, we, we don't have it here. I don't, I don't have, I have it. I'm just not going to pull it up. It'll take too long on the back wall behind those seven gates is the tree of life and flower of life with seven onk keys right in a row on the back of those stargates or gates or whatever you want to define those as. And that's it, 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 for me, I remember uh, Jason, when it, you and I were sitting here uh, during our conversation and we were discussing the flower of life and the numbers and the numbering of it and seven, and I went, wait a minute, check out this shot. Remember? And yeah. I showed you the back wall and, and Jason is putting all of this stuff together and there it is carved at in this into this temple now karnak is huge i don't know what it is a thousand acres or whatever it's 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 crazy big it's huge the the temple of the seven gates which is what it's called is very small it's probably i'm if you can imagine this it's 20 feet by 20 feet you know carved granite uh four walls uh, the roof is no longer there, and it's two separate rooms. You walk in. It's very small. It's smaller than my studio. And you walk in, and there's the, the seven gates. There's a door. You walk to that, to the, the ante room in the back, and, and on that wall is where the flower and tree of life are with the, with the seven onks. And that's it. And it's just a very, very small spot in this. It's, I, th I think Karnak is... I think it is the world's largest temple site, right? I think it is. And they would put that image of the seven gates, um, they call them false doors as well. And they'll put them it in the tombs. So it'll be in front of the tombs. And the uh, mysticism behind that is that they say that the Ka, the spirit of the deceased, is able to uh, enter the false door one day out of the year so that the Ka can then re-enter the tomb to uh, get its life back. So it's almost like a revitalizing chamber for the Ka, the, the body of the deceased. And what's very interesting about the seven door, and I actually discussed this in Astral Genesis, is that um, when you would align the door to the sun, so the temples were aligned very specifically to the sun for various festivals or dates like the equinox and solstices, and when you would put these false doors or the seven gates, um, they would design it in such a way that as the sun passes in front of it, it would cast a shadow on the door. So depending on the shadow of where the shadow is on the door, it becomes like a sundial. So you can actually look at the door and look at the shadows that the door is casting. Um, and you can actually tell uh, what season it is or what month it is just by the shadow. So you'd have to be trained to understand this. And then during a very, very specific day, let's say the equinox or a solstice, that sun is, a, is aligned directly to that center door. So there are no shadows cast on that door. So it's the sun could penetrate and enter the doorway because there's no more shadows. So on that very sacred day, then they could say, okay, this is the day of the festival. And we see this same technology all over the world. We see it a lot in Peru. So they have these false doors uh, carved out of, you know, mountains and rock faces in Peru. And this is the secret is that um, they uh, align with the sun on very specific days to allow the sun to pass through. And when you go to um, the gate of the gods, um, um, just outside of Lake Titicaca there, um, Oh, why is the name escaping me? But the the Tiwanaku, Tiwanaku, yes. And there's um, a door there that uh, you know everybody takes their photo in the door and they say it's a stargate. But when you ask the uh, the priests there, you know what is the story behind it? They say that um, this is where uh, one day out of the year uh, the sun disk enters through this doorway. You know, so um, when you align it and you look at the shadows. 
um, you start to realize that this is a very sophisticated um, culture. They understood the movement of the sun, the cycles of time, and they found very creative ways of um, creating works of art that could uh, reflect the movement of the stars, reflect the movement of the sun, the moon. And uh, this is what we see. So um, when I was writing Astral Genesis, and um, this is the um, conclusion that we found was that all these artifacts, all these hieroglyphs, uh, these tools that were found, they were built in a very, very specific manner using very specific dimensions and scale so that they can calculate the movement of the sun and the stars. Um, and I was obsessed. I was, I was obsessed for a couple of years and I couldn't get this out of my mind. And this is why it was so hard trying to write the next book, which was about the moon, because I felt like I just discovered something and it was a profound discovery that, um, I just learned the ABC of it, but there was still a whole other language that I didn't understand. And when I spoke to you and I started to show you uh, these different numbers that started to come up with the um, Sumerian tablets, suddenly another um, level of that language started to come. It, it just manifested in front of me. So this is why I couldn't move for about uh, three, four months because um, I had to figure it out. I had to put these pieces together. And when what, what's it like uh, for you now because of the knowledge base? What's it like for you now when you look, um, and I've, I've made this comment, I think I even put it in the forward in the book, that you look at something and you can't help yourself. You you look at things differently, and these books help, and especially this one, and uh, Astral Genesis, too, as well. Uh, the two should be read together. Um, but uh, in, in Gates of the Anunnaki, hopefully the reader will be able to look at stuff, and yeah, it's got an aesthetic value to it, Right? There's something. Yeah. Okay. I get that. Man, that's cool. That's cool looking. Yeah. Okay. Sure. See that first. But then really look at it because that's what you do. Right? Now you're looking at something and you're going, man, okay, 23 degrees. And then man, look at that. Okay. We got 100. Okay. 144. Okay. Oh, man. We got the procession going on. Right? Yeah, just like, <laughs> You know, what's that like? Are you able to appreciate the artistic side of things now? I, or is it fully, fully, you know, uh, full on geometry? No, I'm just, I'm just so blown away because I realize that what we're looking at is not art. It's, it's a science and it's, it's a deep knowledge. It's not people like drawing cartoons or anything like that. These are like highly trained priests who probably studied their whole life to make that image. And that image is an, a language and it's the language of symbolism, but it's more complicated than the language of symbolism because symbolism is a way of interpreting something. Um, what I'm trying to show is that they put a language that it's not proto cuneiform where it's a symbol of the object. So it's like, you can see the symbol of the object and you can, okay, this is proto cuneiform. Um, it's not a hieroglyph where it's like, okay, this is a, a picture of an arm and it means a measuring or this or that, right? Um, what I am finding is that they built a, another language within the symbols. And the language is geometry. And depending on the geometry of the symbol um, and the, the, um, the proportions of how things are laid out in a very specific grid, um, that in itself tells a very specific story. So it's basically, um, if you're, let's say, the god of the sun, 
or a solar deity, they would design the solar deity using the numbers of the sun or the proportions of the sun or the angles of the sun. So very, very specific things. Um, and this is a huge discovery because um, the way that we get our seasons is that uh, the earth is tilted. Actually, you have a picture of this. I sent you a picture. I, I, do, I, I do. I do. Do we? Okay. So I, I can pull this up. It's called seasons, I think. No, I have it. I have it right here. But yeah. um, um, I was wondering yeah. if, if showing this is too early. Um, well, because, I, but, but no, it's up now. Uh, we've got it here. And here are the tilts. Now, let's remember a couple of things, okay, that um, uh, get referenced time and time and time again uh, throughout uh, the gates of the Anunnaki. Um, so here's the tilt. Okay, so let's go through this. This is the spring equinox. Uh, well, the, that's below, but but this I mean, is uh, what gives, uh, uh, yeah. This is what gives our our seasons is that our Earth is tilted at twenty three point five degrees off the elliptical plane, and they historians today uh, believe that this was discovered only two thousand years ago. All right, so they believe this was discovered two thousand years ago, and. What I am finding is that it wasn't discovered 2,000 years ago. I can find examples of people using this angle to describe the earth and the sun and the seasons um, going back to Gobekli Tepe, you know, and it's not just random um, pieces of art. I, I have found it hundreds of times and it's become so unbelievably obvious that they knew that these ancient people knew um, these very specific numbers of geometry relating to seasons, relating to the stars, relating to the moon, relating to the sun, relating to the earth. Like all of these numbers they knew um, going back at least 6,000 years. And it's evident because we have the pyramids that contain these numbers. You know, so we have temples that contain these numbers. We have artifacts that contain these numbers. But the, the issue is, is that because it's not a language, like an alphabet or hieroglyphs or proto-cuneiform, people cannot see it because they, they don't understand or they were never taught that you could have um, a language based on numbers and geometry. And this, I believe, is a hidden secret language uh, that has been passed down through initiations for thousands of years. And um, the latest um, examples I could find of this language was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was like an expert on this, and he basically put these numbers in his artwork. Now, um, um, I, let me let me say this. He's right. got... Uh, a, a big chunk of the book leads into and is about Leonardo. Um, and so when you get the book, you'll understand uh, how deep this actually goes. And that's modern history. So um, when you get the book, it's there. Uh, let me back up. Yes. Okay. Let's, uh, let's back off of Leonardo for a second. You mentioned, and I want everybody to enjoy the book just like I did. So to get to this, which, which is up on the screen right now, uh, with the 23 and a half degrees and the equator and the elliptic and the seasons, and then here is the breakdown here, um, uh, uh, March 21st, uh, uh, which was uh, yesterday, spring equinox. Uh, which I talked about yesterday on the show, September 21st, June 21st, and December 21st. Um, yesterday, the spring equinox, and the ancients knew this. This is what, you know what the craziest part about the spring equinox is that most people don't know? Night and day are exactly the same in the northern and the southern hemisphere on that one day day equals night 
and night equals day in both the northern and southern hemisphere. Isn't what, that crazy? Isn't that isn't it's is it that's why it's called equinox. Yes. Right? Now I I I thought it was introducing, you know, uh spring and and saying goodbye to what I you know that's that's you know the pop culture version of this, right? And everybody, oh it's spring equinox, okay, all right. We're, we're well no, no, it's because right now di- how could the ancients have known that? How how is that? We're talking about two different hemispheres. How how would they know that? You would know that over lengths of time, right? Handing this down and teaching and 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 keeping it in, in uh, keeping it sacred and well, and keeping it generational. It's. Uh... This goes back to the Sumerians. The Sumerians, um, as we can tell, or what we know today is that uh, they did map the stars. They mapped the sky. They're the ones who divided the heavens into 12 uh, constellations. They uh, created this 60 um, numbering system. Let's get to that. But, let's, oh, let's wait, talk I want to talk about, I just want to finish with this, is that, uh, so, okay. so this is what we see as the solar cross. Okay, so there's four positions. Um, around the sun that creates this solar cross that defines um, the cycles of our year. And this is known by ancient cultures uh, going back at least to the Neolithic period or before. Now, how did they do this? Um, they created mounds on the earth. Um, they, they plotted stones at the rising position of the sun on the horizon um, every day or, or every month, every moon cycle, they'll see where that sun rises on the horizon and they'll put like a stone there. And over a year, they noticed that the sun would move over the horizon from, uh, if you look at the east or the west, it would move from the horizon going south to north and then back and forth. So they knew that there was a place where the sun would go to the furthest south and the furthest north. And this is where we get the terms Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. Uh, these are the places where the sun stands still for three days. And that's where you get the summer solstice and the winter solstice. And then as it comes back, it crosses through the center point, which we get tw- uh, 12 hours of night and 12 hours of day. Another Sumerian invention of the numbers of the day or the hours of the day. and uh, this is um, the equinox. It's the the crossing point um, of the year from um, an equinox to a solstice. So this is known, and this is I, it may sound boring, but this is this is one of the first keys to understand that opens up this whole sacred geometry. All right, it's a numbering system, and the Sumerians, going back to the first um, cuneiform. And the base 60 model of cuneiform numbering system, uh, they knew what numbers to use that can define all of these cycles, all of these. Oh, yeah, here's some, some cuneiform. And this is the base 60. So we have, um, you know, it's just um, a stylist. It's a wooden stylist on clay. So they just kind of hit, put the wooden stylus in clay to make the mark. And that long one is 60. And then you have 60, and that's a number 10. So it's 60 times 10, you get 600. And then you have two 60s uh, right there. So it's 60 times 60, you get uh, 3,600. And that actually even goes more. So we can put like a number 10 inside there, and we can multiply that. So it's uh, 36,000. Or we can put another uh, so says in the middle of that, and then you do sixty times sixty times sixty equals two hundred and sixteen thousand. So it's it they knew these very specific numbers, and boy, like when you get into the book, we really get into these numbers and what they actually mean. But they basically um, were able to measure um, the distance or how big the Earth is. The distance between the planet and the earth, the planet and the sun, the 
the size of the moon, the size of the sun, um, the uh, the procession of the the procession of the zodiac. They they knew how to divide time in such a way that it fit perfectly into these numbering systems. Um, and when you really see the genius of how this all works and how it all fits together, you kind of sit back. And if you showed this to a modern uh, historian or modern archaeologist who studies this, they would just say, oh, this is impossible. Like they, the, There's no way they could have known about this. This is only known of, from modern technology. We've only learned about this over the past hundred or so years. How would a culture that goes back 6,000 years or more know? Because remember, the first city of um, uh, Iteru is uh, 5400 BC or 5300 BC. That's that's over 7,000 years ago. It was the first city. And then you have uh, Uruk, which is uh, 4,500 BC. So this is over six. And the first cuneiform came around uh, 3,500 or mo more BC. So we're talking like at least 5,000 plus years that they had uh, known or something was passed down to them or taught to them that is so profound that when we actually look at it on paper, we'll say it's impossible that they knew this, but it's right there in front of us. And that's what this you, book is about. Yeah. You, you lay out, there's um, a section in the book where you, you go from, and it's explained perfectly. Oh, by the way, so Jason calls me, and I and I and I told him, I said, "Look, man, I I I've, I've had a version after version of the book, right, coming at me, and and I'm and then I skip to the end, and then I'm, I'm thinking I'm picking up. I'm like, wait a minute, okay, hold on, and and I went and I thought, you know what, I've just I, I I've got to just read through it. I've just got to read. I, I I I can't cheat. I just can't read the inside of the front cover and say that I've read this book. Right? <laughs> so many. I remember Richard Dolan told me that. Hey, man, you know how I read a book? I read the front cover. You know, and that's uh, that's all I need. I, uh, and uh, sorry about that, Richard. I think he said that on the <laughs> show, though. I think he said it on the show. Anyway, so I, I'm going through, and 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 uh, so. You go section by section, circle, triangle, um, anatomy, uh, degrees, numbers, boom, 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 boom. And then in, in, at the end of that chapter, you've got the Great Pyramid and its degrees, circle, it's got that. That that earth, right? And everything all and it's it's so well presented. And then in the end, all because of this right here. You know what I mean? And and that when you get to that point as a reader and you look at that, that's where I think historians, archaeologists, and anthropologists, Egyptologists. Um, museum curators, right? <laughs> and that whole crew, that that's a tough thing to deny when you look at it the way that you presented it in Gates of uh, Gates of the Anunnaki. And um, I, I put the Pyramid of Giza, uh, the Great Pyramid, in there very specifically because of the inner structure. So everybody knows, okay, it's uh, 51.84 degrees um, slope of the angle of the pyramid. And I also show how to create that using the um, Vesica Pisces. Uh, using two circles, you can create that triangle. Um, but what I wanted to show was that the Egyptians, whoever designed the architect of that pyramid, they knew these numbers very specifically. And every... Um, Every inch of that pyramid on the inside, the chambers, the tunnels, the ascending, ascending, excuse me, king's chamber, queen's chamber, everything that's in that pyramid, once you apply the numbers that I show in the book to the inner proportions of the pyramid, it's a 100% match. 
It's a hundred percent match. And so whatever that's saying is that this was one of the greatest knowledge, one of the greatest pieces of knowledge ever uh, discovered by ancient humans. And it was such an amazing discovery that they basically encoded it directly into the design of the pyramid. So everybody's looking, well, what's the purpose of the pyramid? You know, what's the secret? What's all this? The pyramid itself is literally a vault in stone of sacred geometry with its exact proportions um, laid out. And the only way that you can understand that is if you understand the numbers. And what and obviously, um, and this is going back to astral genesis because when you look at a structure, you can say this structure is, you know, 200 plus feet high, right? And the base, whatever the dimensions are. And then you can look at another structure and you can say, this is like half the size, right? So how is this and this the same? But if you have the proportions, the scale doesn't matter. You could have it as a pendant. The numbers will not change as a proportion. You could have it as a pendant and you can blow it up into a pyramid. Those numbers don't change. It's just the scale of the proportions. So once you understand the numbers behind it, it opens up a whole other world um, of possibilities. So it's almost like they're uh, showing off. When I look at the pyramid, they're showing off. They're saying, we understand, we know the numbers, and we have basically created a symbol of, of uh, the numerical constants of creation, a fractal mathematical constant of creation and we're presenting it in a way of architecture that only um, the initiated will understand. And remember, when you go back in ancient philosophy or mysticism, they always refer to um, some of the creator gods as the great architects, or you know, Jesus was a carpenter. You know, they were they were all builders, builders of form, and this was what um, the creator gods represented. So when you uh, start to understand and put these numbers together with architecture, with different um, sacred geometry, with different images, suddenly uh, you start to see it in a completely different language. And, and, and going back to what you were saying before about do I see things differently now, is that um, I don't even need my computer anymore to, to, to figure out the, the scale. It's like when I look at it, I go, oh, this is a solar motif or this has to do with the moon or, or this has to do with the tilt of the earth and you can tell by how it's laid out or or if it's um has to do with different constellations and stars because they would they would actually um take the different stars and constellations and create gods and and archetypes of these different constellations and put those attributes into these ancient gods um you know, so when you would see, let's say, like a scorpion being, you know, what is the scorpion being or a scorpion being holding uh, a bow and arrow? You know, what does this mean? Well, this is a combination of Scorpio and Sagittarius, and it represents the fall, you know, that right before it kills you and you go into winter. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, I'm going to bring up this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring up two images, but for uh, the first one I'm going to bring up is, is Ishtar. And, uh, you know, when, it's, it's so funny, uh, Jason, Ishtar, the movie, right. That came out. Some say that, and I, I remember when I was a kid, when this, the movie came out, it was the worst movie ever made. Right, Dustin Hoffman, and and what? Uh, so anyway, uh, but Ishtar, right? Okay, and it's it's a horrible movie. It it it's so bad. It's 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 kind of good. It's like that bad. It's that bad. But um, I I grew up with that that thing, the criticism of the movie Ishtar, and when I. And, or I remember as a kid, wait a minute, that's that's Sumerian, that's a Sumerian god. Okay. So now every time I say Ishtar, I think of Dustin Hoffman. It's kind of a weird thing. I've just got it in my head. Anyway, I'm gonna pull up uh this 
uh, 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 image here of the goddess Ishtar uh, from the British Museum. Okay, and let's pull this up first because right after this, uh, we're going to do an image of Horus. Okay, so let's pull this up first. And um, I'm going to enlarge this so everybody could see. Just We're going to start with the top half first. Let's go here because we have two different uh, things going on uh, that are repeated um, in all of these images and throughout this image. But there's your 23 and a half degrees and your yes. 15 degrees. Um, let's start there. Remember, that is the tilt of the earth. Yes. So um, what she's holding in her hands is not a mystery. Everybody thinks it's a mystery and, you know, there's a lot of ancient alien episodes about it, but right in the descent of Inanna's uh, 5,000 year old myth, um, it it's, says that she's holding in her hand her, me her lapis measuring rod and line. Okay, so they were astronomical measuring tools. So right in the myth, it tells you exactly what she's holding. So that mystery is solved right away. Um, <laughs> and when you look at this, um, the first thing you notice, if you didn't see the lines that I put on there, is that they're not straight. So they start off straight, and then in her hand, they curve, or not curve, they, they shift in a different degree. So right when there. you draw the line to follow it, um, you get in uh, from the left hand, the blue line, you have 15 degrees. Now, what is so special about 15 degrees? Uh, 15 degrees is the division of time. So the sun moves through the sky 15 degrees every hour. All right. So every hour of time is 15 degrees. So that could be measuring the heavens, the movement of the sun. Now, 23 degrees is the tilt of the earth, which gives us our seasons. And you can see that, um, and this is in many um, artifacts, I think over a hundred of them that I found where the 23.5 degree line goes directly into the eye. You know, and this is why they say like the eye of Horus and the, the eye is basically the symbol of the sun. It's the solar deity. Um, also, it's through the eye and the hand that is the first measuring tool because from your eye to your hand to the horizon equals 15 degrees so you can measure hours if you put your hand to the horizon like this you can actually measure time using your body so if you uh, zoom out a little uh let me uh, okay. stop you right there uh, sure. because if we go back to the base 60 uh, and, and people will automatically, and I get it, right, with that we live in a base 10 world, right? Well, no, we live in both. <laughs> we live in both. Now, yeah, right? Five and five, 10, right? And and we can count to 10, the decimal system, 10 units of 10, $10, 10 cents, everything, 10, right? Okay. Let's talk about 60 for a second and why that 15 degrees is so important. Sure. How about 60 minutes? How about 60 seconds? How about a quarter of an hour? That's 15 minutes, right? And, and that's why that 15 degrees is so important. 360 degrees in a circle. We still, we live in both worlds at the same time, and we don't know it. We don't have a 100-minute hour. We have a 60-minute hour. And our time, the way that time works, that's a base 60 system. The 60 seconds on your watch and, 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 and the 360 degrees in a circle and all of that is a base 60 system. So we live in both at the same time, don't we? Yeah, and using the 10 digits of our hands, we could actually get the same thing. Um, if you look at the four digits, okay, now I'm getting into secret hand signs, so, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, so basically you got your four fingers and you have three divisions on each finger, okay? So you got three, um, so you got th uh, so you got three divisions. So you have four fingers, which equals twelve. 
Okay. One, so, two, yeah. three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, twelve. Right. You got twelve right there. So when you're mm-hmm. counting, you can go one, two, three, and count twelve, right? Twelve times five. Sixty. Sixty. All right, okay. When your hand is in the air like this, and like I said before, you're looking at the sun and the horizon, your hand equals 15 degrees, which equals one hour of time. Each finger is 15 minutes. That's right. Isn't that crazy? And, and, uh, um, wait, 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 no, we live in a base 10 world. Dude, just bap, bop, 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 and there's your watch. That was and- your wrist watch. And when you go like this and you count and you go like get your six and then your six, 180 degrees is the, the arc of heaven is 180 degrees, you know, and that's, and then obviously that's half of 360, 36, six times six is 36, you know, so it's these repeating number patterns, um, that uh, so when you see things in Bible where they are in the Bible or in ancient texts where they're saying very specific numbers, you have to understand where these numbers first came from and what their true intention and meaning were, um, because it was basically these are the measurements of heaven and earth, but you had to be trained to understand how these numbers work. Now let's get back to the image. Okay, so uh, the bottom half. Yes, we just saw the top half. Here's the bottom half. Um, so what I was trying to show is that, uh, from the head down to the wings, um, it follows the 23.5 degrees. So her whole image is based on the 23.5 degree angle, um, on each side, which is the seasons is the tilt of the earth between, um, solstice to solstice. The center line is the equinox and she's standing on two lions, double lions. And from her belly button, and her womb, if you draw the lines from there to there, they go directly into the eyes at 23.5 degrees. Remember I said that there's something very specific about the eye is the the secret symbol of the sun. The eye is the secret symbol of the sun. So that when you uh, connect the eyes to very specific parts of the image, uh, they will make an alignment exactly to 23.5 degrees. So this is uh, hidden geometry that the architects or the artists, they built the image on. So it was a very deliberate, specific um, hidden geometry that was placed in these images. And only if you were initiated, you would see this and understand it. It's crazy when you look at uh, when you look at uh, her arms now, right? And and you just look at that and the way the wings are, and where the lion the lions uh, are placed with their eyes, her belly button, her womb, all of, and it is just parallel, perfect, twenty three and a half degrees. It's not. This is not. Uh, imagination. And by the way, this isn't a drawing. This is at the British Museum. This, yeah, is, this a, is the artifact. Somebody's in, yeah, this is the artifact itself. This is an interpretation. Now, let's pull this down and let's go right here over to Egypt. And now this is Horus. And you can see Horus is standing in a very similar position and and he's holding things in his hands. And instead of standing on two uh, lions, he's standing on two crocodiles. And you have these two poles on either side. And if you measure the poles to his eyes, they're aligned exactly at 23.5 degrees. And they also go through the eyes of the crocodile. They go through the eyes of uh, the bird, you can see it goes through the eyes of the bird, uh, Horus, the Horus bird on the pole. And But what's very interesting about this, so this image, it's called Horus the Savior. Uh, that's what they called it. It was very popular in the middle to New Kingdom, um, 1800 BC. So um, almost 4,000 years old, this image. Um, Ishtar is around the same time. Um, if not a couple hundred years earlier than this. 
So we see the influence, the same influence from Samaria um, to Egypt. And But this is what's very interesting. If you zoom in to what he's holding. Which hand? Both. Uh, you could just zoom in on either hand. It's two serpents in each hand. And then underneath, he's holding um, a scorpion. Yep, right here. Uh, and then on the other hand is a lion. Yep. And th next to the scorpion is an ibex. Yep. Oh, or sorry, it's an oryx. Oryx, ibex? Either no, way. No, ibex is a bird. Okay, so it's an oryx. Um, That's an oryx right there. Yes. So basically, um, if you remember your Bible verses, um, these are the angels of Ezekiel's vision of the wheels within wheels, uh, the four the four headed angels, uh, one with the head of the lion, one with the head of the eagle, one with the head of the bull, and one the head of a man. And what that actually is is the solar cross of the zodiac, which is Taurus, Scorpio, Leo, and Aquarius in the age of Taurus. So this is an astrological image showing you Horus, which is the solar deity. Um, his hair, I, I don't know if you notice his hair, is in um, a braid on the side of his head. Do you know what that is? That comes from, um, uh, it talks about it in the Book of the Dead um, or the Pyramid Texts. And basically it says that the braid is representative of the scorpion's tail. So it is Scorpio, and on the side of his head is the sun passing through Scorpio. So these are all sim it's all symbolism. But if you don't understand the symbolism, um, and then you have um, uh, Bess, is it Bess? Yeah, it's Bess on the top of his head, which is, uh, it's basically the northern star. It's the north, uh, it's the north, um, uh, protector of children and mothers. Um, so basically what you're looking at is the sun moving through the constellations. And this is what that image is. Um, I, I'm telling you right now, the, the length of the staff and 23 and a half de uh, degrees to his eyeball is crazy town. It's perfect. That's, that, that's crazy town, man. That is crazy town. This crazy town, the, this whole thing, and the similarities. You know, Ishtar being uh, uh, on on the top of two lions, and and here Horus is on top of uh, two crocodiles. Very interesting uh, how how similar they are. When allegedly, you know, if you, they, they everybody wants to separate the two cultures. Giza is separate, man. Egypt is separate. Sumer and Mesopotamia, that's a completely separate situation. You need to read this book, everybody, and 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 go through this and see how all of this is connected. I'm telling you, uh, Jason, I, I, I want to stress this. When you lay it out, when you go from the two circles, right, and and end up with the pyramid and and the moon and the sun and circumferences and radius and and procession and and tilt and and everything and and how those numbers line up and and how they were generated originally and it's laid out in the book you guys need to go and check this out from the king's list you know that's that's and it's just completely all the way to Gilgamesh and the Ark and 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 the 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 levels of the Ark. Right now, we just showed the cube. Yeah, you need to see the breakdown in the book. Um, but anyway, boom, 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 and it's just done so well, Jason. It's just Thank done you. so well, so well. Because you know the biggest complaint that I got about Astral Genesis was that. Uh, it's too complicated. <laughs> like, it's just too complicated, Jason. Um, very detailed. Too. It's a little complicated. I know. <laughs> if you if you read it, yeah. It, it, look, you have to you just just go through it. The methodology is there if you read it uh, in order. It's it's not complicated because Jason walks you uh, through it. If you skip to the middle of the book, 
And you just think that, right, some light bulb's going to go off and you're going to understand. No, no, no. You can't, you can't cheat with this. Um, yes. and let's, well, let's, uh, let's pull, I'm a, sure. you, you brought up, uh, a da earlier. Yes. And, uh, so, uh, take us through this. This is fascinating. Again, this has to do with symbolism. So this is the Anunnaki you have, um, um, I'll just use the names that people are familiar with. You have Enki on uh, the right-hand side there. And Enki is the one, uh, stepping on this square mound. And he has uh, streams of water coming out of his shoulder with fish. He's holding a bird. And underneath him is a, um, it's a goat. And he's stepping over the goat on this mound. On the other side of the mound, you have Ishtar. And she's holding uh, barley in one hand. And coming out of the center of the two mounds, you have Shemesh, or Utu, which is the god of the sun. He's holding a knife in his hand. He's holding Ishtar by the foot, and there's heat rays coming off of him. So, you know, if, if you don't understand symbolism and ancient mysticism, you'll look at this and you go, what is going on here? How, like, how, what does this even mean? How does it make sense, right? Well, you have to understand that in ancient um, Samaria, there was only really two seasons. Um, the seasons were the wet season, and or the wet season and the dry season, or the are the uh, the summer season and the winter season. Like those are the only two seasons in ancient Samaria. And uh, you have the wet season, which is the beginning of winter, and it's represented by Enki. He brings the water, and you can see the water coming out of him. He's feeding life. He's also stepping over um, a goat, which is an ancient asterism of um capricorn all right so this is um the winter solstice is the start of the wet season then you go to the other mound and remember the two mounds are very ancient symbols of the two mounds of creation and the two mounds of the creation has to do with the sun and the moon uh, the sun rises from the mound of the east bringing new life it's like the horus of egypt the birth of horus comes out of the eastern mound of the eastern horizon and it sets in the western mound which is the um the uh, the mound of the dead this is where we get the necropolises this is where we get um this is where you go when you die you enter the portal or the gate of the west um here it's ishtar um in egypt it's hathor and then um in the center here you have um between the two sacred mounds you have the sun, which is Shemesh. And so she's holding barley in her hand. And she is the goddess of fertility. So you have Enki, who's watering the earth, bringing fertility to, to the land. And then you have the growth. So you have life. Ishtar is life, fertility, growth, ag agriculture. She's holding the barley in her hand, the fruit of the land. And then you have Shemesh, which is representative of summer. And what's summer in Mesopotamia? It's hot, right? He has the heat rays rising off his shoulders. He's the, he's the summer, and he's coming for Ishtar with the, the knife because he is going to harvest the Cut barley. The barley, yeah. yeah. That's, so this is an astrological map of the seasons based on the gods. So if you don't understand the symbolism, if you don't understand the the um, what the gods are, first represented then it would be very hard to interpret what this image means and if you go to um i think i put it the gate of enki i think that's the image it's the next image here we go all right so uh, there's something called a kuduru and these kudurus are known as boundary stones, and they're found all over um, Azaria and, and Babylon and, and um, all throughout uh, into the later kingdoms, the Babylonian era, the, the Azarian area, era. And these boundary stones, they had these images of these gates, gates of the gods. That's you know where the name of the book came from, the gates of the gods. And they put them at the top of the kuduru, these boundary stones. 
and they would represent the god. So each gate had a god on it. So at the top of the boundary stone, there may be three gates, four gates, depending on what gods they wanted to show. And on top of that would have the three symbols of uh, the Anunnaki, which is um, the star of Ishtar, the star of um, Shemesh, and the, the crescent moon of Nana. They would have these three symbols, and they would be surrounded by a giant serpent, which represents um, either the Milky Way, the progression through the Milky Way, or it represents um, Draco, the northern constellation that wraps around the North Star, or the northern heavens. And so this is a version of Enki coming out of the gate. And um, Enki is connected to the goat, but you can see this goat um, is half fish. So it's a half goat, half fish. And so this was the ancient image of Enki, the god of water. And it's actually where we get the image of Capricorn on the zodiac from. And in that, and Capricorn is um, uh, December, January. It's from the um, December solstice, so the winter solstice. And like, isn't that amazing that they had this information back then? And this is where we get our symbols from. This is where we get the dates from. So the gates that we see on top with the gods represented times of year. So as the sun passed through the different gates of the constellations, they were represented as the seasons and passing through the doorways, just like we see at the gates that you showed me in Karnak. The sun passes through the gates of the constellation of Capricorn during the winter se season, the wet season, and um, this was all mapped out. But this information has been lost in time. And, you know, you see this uh, exact symbol all over Peru, all over Pumapunku, Tiwanaku. Um, it is everywhere. It's everywhere you go. And I, I, um, uh, when I was standing, when you first enter Tiwanaku, uh, and, and you head up uh, the first hill and you come around the corner, there are a couple of uh, uh, large stones there that are sitting by themselves on the top of this hill. And and I, I've got some pictures of it, but on the top of one of the stones is this. Well, anyway, from there, you can look at Pumapunku. It's right there. Pumapunku's just right down the hill. You can walk to it in five minutes. There's Pumapunku. And now the traditional, the orthodox, right, archaeologists um, will tell you that Pumapunku and Tiwanaku are, are not connected. Now, wait a minute. First off, you can see it, right? It's right there. So don't tell me that there is no connection between that of which I can hit with a rock from where I am standing, right? And I'm looking at the symbolism of this, and you can see it. Uh, you go to the H blocks, right? The famous H blocks. Go on the back side of the H blocks, and you see this, right? It's, it's like bizarre. And you see this it, it nearly identical symbol. But you know what else this reminds me of? The T pillars at Gobekli Tepe. Yeah. Right? And so it's repeated over and over again. This reminds me of the gate at Amaru Muru. And, and, and that uh, portal, it's a portal. But this reminds me of that uh, too as well. The entire construction of it, the T-shirt that I have from Amaru Muru, is, is this symbol. But right? I so... It, it, it's it's global is what I'm saying. Yeah, and that's what the book Astral Genesis was about, um, is that I wanted to actually prove, using geometry and mathematics, I wanted to actually prove that the symbol in this culture, even going back to Gobekli Tepe, is identical to the exact degrees as something you could find in Peru. 
and it meant the exact same thing. So I, I was trying to show that um, this is not something that they just figured out on their own. This is something that was taught to them or passed down to them from um, a very advanced civilization in our prehistory that we have no understanding of yet. And um, when you look at the T-pillars, uh, especially uh, pillar uh, 43, I believe it is, uh, the T-pillar 43 at Gobekli Tepe, where it shows uh, the different animals, it shows the scorpion, it shows different birds, it shows the snake, it shows the hand baskets, all these things. Um, that is literally a map of the constellations. It's the upper world and lower world and where the sun moves through it through the year. Are and you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Are you sitting down? Are you sitting down? Are you sitting down? I am. You, yeah. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Check this out. And I found this by accident. Bam. Oh, my. Bam. That's your picture. Yeah. 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 I That's Tiamanaku. I just got chills. I just got chills. Because is that this nuts? Is, is, is the symbol. Is, 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 is that nuts? That is, is that nuts? Okay, you want more? I got more. You want more? I, I I got more. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me let me go here for a second. Do 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 do. You ready? I'm going to now take you to the back. I'm going to take you to the back. You ready? Yeah, I'm here. Are you, are you sitting down? You need to be sitting down. Are you sitting down? I need to I'm make sitting. sure that I, you're sitting. I, I need to make I, sure that you are sitting down. Are you sitting down? Let me swallow first. Okay. 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 You ready? Yes, I'm ready. You ready? I mean, this is going to be a lot to handle. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. That's the back of an H block. It's Look exactly, at that. It's, it's exactly. Look at that. This is the, the gates of the gods. Literal Look at that. definition. That's, a, of that's an H block at Puma Punku. Yes. And that's the back of it. What you're looking at here is, is that knowledge. is that crazy? Is is that is that insane? You know, and so I, I want everybody, to, I mean, the impact of of this, what we are talking about here, and and let's go back to this is why uh, I call Jason. you all the time. Because yeah. you have this is yeah. this is this is Anunnaki. Yes. And 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 you go and this is why you share ideas. Right? It's it's about let's just lump it all together, right? And that's why when I went, I said to Jason, wait a minute, this reminds me of something I've this reminds me of wait, wait, what? What? And and when you see something like uh, not only what I'm showing you now, but when I say I was just at Tiwanaku and I saw the same exact thing, well, it's one thing to talk. No, I just showed you the picture that I took at Tiwanaku. Mm -hmm. And when I took that picture, by the way, at Tiwanaku, which was this one, um, uh, I'm walking. Let me let me get to this image again because it literally stopped me in my tracks, man. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. So I've got two two of these images here. All right, so I'm walking. I'm walking through Tiwanaku. I'm shooting video. I'm doing this and and <laughs> Jason. I'm yes. walking. This is a stone sitting in the middle of the desert. Right by itself, and I'm walking down this path, and I'm trying to get to this thing, and I just walk past. I went, Ert! and I stepped back, and I took that picture, and then I took another one just to make sure. That's my friend there I was walking with, and I went, "Wait a minute, dude, that's what's on the H blocks," and I'm serious, Jason. Listen to me. Yes. Archaeologists will tell you that Pumapunku and Tiwanaku were different cultures and different time periods. And it's like, wait a minute, that 
is carved into the H blocks right over there. Don't tell you cannot. And believe me, they argue this point. They don't want people talking about this. They don't want the, the, the discussion about it. And then this symbol is in ancient Sumer and Mesopotamia, and it's also in where? In Egypt? It's in Egypt. In Karnak? Right, yeah. 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 And um, at Tiwanaku, they have the uh, image of the staff god, the solar deity at the gate of the sun, holding the two staffs. Um, you want to see that? I have it. I'm um, sure. Sure. It's, 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 uh, I got it. It's I beautiful. wish I could share, share my screen, but I, it's like, I don't want to give away the, the. Okay. Let me, oh, wait. No, it's, it's after this. Hold on. You got to, I'm walking around the temple. <laughs> okay. This is me walking. See, this is what you find there, by the yes. way. It's just stuff sitting out in, in, in the middle, which is when I found this. And, uh, yeah. I'm, these drill holes, right? Yeah. So anyway, by the way, let me back up. Puma Punku is right at the bottom of this hill, right on the other side. That's where uh, Puma Punku is. All right. So they don't and here, want you to know there's a connection. Okay. The so here, put it together. Here's the steps to the Sun Gate right here that Jason is talking about. And uh, now, does that? What does that remind you of? It reminds me of Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe. Look at that man. He's got a belt. You know, and I'm I'm looking at this, and I'm like, wait a minute here. What is going on? Okay, so that's the steps. There it is right there. I got some close-up pictures of it here in a second. But... Uh, yeah, Tiwanaku is unbelievable, man. It is so, so massive. And um and does that what does that look like to you? Looks like an uh, alien gray. It definitely looks like someone from another world. I mean, I I, I don't know. Okay, there we are. This is at the uh the temple of this uh the sun gate. Right there, and and I might have. I like his shirt. That's a cool shirt. Yeah, I have that shirt. I have it. The monkey shirt from Nazca. Yeah, and aligning with the uh, stars. Amazing. Yeah, Man, these are is... the gates of the gods. Yep. Right there. And that's even what it... they used to call them. Now, call them. so you see this? Do yeah. not pass. I've got it roped off. Right behind Brian. You can't see it here. There's a guard just right there, man, just watching everything that we just following us around. And big, uh, you know, they know Brian really, really well. And uh, but look at that. And then you got someone like me coming along and saying, oh, they don't. and saying, I could, um, I can prove that the image of the sun god holding the staffs on that gate are an identical match to something found at the temple of Karnak. And when I mean identical, I mean identical, uh, down to the exact geometry. So now I have, I have one other shot of, uh, it started to rain. I mean, the rains came in. Look, 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 there's another pillar. Look yeah. at that, dude. I mean, I I don't, I, uh, and nobody else, I'm by myself, and, and I'm just walking around. This is a massive, Tiwanaku is huge. And I rounded the corner and saw this. I'm like, it's go back, Lee Tappy. It's like, is it just in our DNA to represent the human form on a pillar like this with the arms crossed like that? Is it, is it just, or is there something else going on? I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Here it is. Yes. There it is. And uh, this is remarkable. Yes. It's, I, I'm so tempted to share parts of the book just to and show 
but <laughs> I'm just so tempted. But yeah. when when you go there again, um, this is uh, Puma Punku is right here. To so to suggest that, um, and those are the only buildings like in this whole area. It's in the high desert. There's you know you're at thirteen thousand feet, something like that. Um, but to suggest that something right here. You know, uh, like two blo- when you when you when you drive there, it's twenty seconds. I think 30, 30 second drive. It's just right at the right, right and there's Puma Punku. Um, uh, but uh, this gate is just like the most mind blowing thing, and it it's alignment. Um, which I'm doing here. Look at the sun coming through. Look at that. Isn't that nuts? And look, this is the rain coming. And just in about two seconds, I got some crazy video too. This is a look at the, you see the raindrops. Look. Yeah. We're all getting rained on. Um, go back. Tepe much. <laughs> Get that man, uh, and that do you remember, this is do you yeah, go ahead. I showed remember I showed you the picture of Horace with the two staffs next to him and the 23 degree line going to his eyes. Uh huh. The staff gods, that's all I got to say, and then you could figure the rest out in the book. Okay, I'm gonna pull up. Um, I have. Uh, I took multiple pictures, by the way. So I want everybody to see this again. This is three, not one. Okay. Not one. Not two. Just to show that this is not some coincidence. Okay. All right. There's an, this is an, it's not the same image. You see it? Yeah. That's the back. Look. Is that crazy? You ready? You ready? This is the block next to it. Bam. Yeah. You ready? What's going on, man? That's uh, yeah. That is just. This is the front. This is the front of the H block. So I was taking shots of, but but look really close here, Jason. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Look, look, look. I I see. I see the whap, 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 whap. It's the gate. It's the gate. Yeah. What do you see here? Yes. What do you see here? Right? Has, and, has anybody and, has anybody said this before? Um, I, I as I'm walking through, well, me and my friend that you saw with the glasses, yeah, uh, he's from Texas. I can't remember his name right now. Um, but anyway, we uh, kind of buddied up. Uh, well, we were there for three weeks in Peru, but uh, the last we did Pumo Punku last. Uh, on on the tour, uh, Pumupunku, Tiwanaku, and and Titicaca in Bolivia. But anyway, he is noticing we're both seeing the repetition of stuff. You know, we come from a Marumuru and and the you know the 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 key, the portal that's on the side of the the mountain. Uh, there, that is one of the craziest things that you'll ever see. But it's the shape. Right, it's this shape, and we're starting to see it like everywhere we go, and and then so we go to Puma Punku, and I'm seeing the shape again, and so I photographed it on purpose there, and then we're over in Tiwanaku, and we're walking around, and then we see it over there, and and again, I want to stress the archaeologists that are there are will say that these are two different cultures two different time periods they're not connected with each other the h blocks and tiwanaku no no they are complete and yet 
they have the same identical carvings in them. And so, yeah, I, I it's okay. So I, I just can, I, for me walking through, this is all Puma Punku here. Um, I'm seeing this repetition. You see it? You see yes, it? Look, 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 it's right here. Yeah. It's called the Tori gate in Japan. Those are Tori gates. Now, out of, um, uh, I'm going to back up. Okay, look, just full of it. Look, 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 Beautiful. look, look, look. You see it? There's another one here. And it's just like I I couldn't help but. <laughs> oh, but look, no- see the snake going up the side there? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Um, see the now, same thing in Egypt. Now, this. This is what's crazy about this right here. I'm guessing. I'm. I'm not sure. Okay, this may have stood upright at one point. Okay, but let's again. I was photographing uh, the backs of these blocks, and then and then I noticed. I looked at this stone. Mm-hmm. It says red granite. Okay, you see the size of the people here. Yes. Okay, so these stones continue all the way down here. It's about four feet thick. I'm going to guess and say this is probably 50 feet, right? 50 feet. It's huge. Wow. Right? But they are connected. And I started to look, and I went, wait a minute, look. That's a key lock. Yeah. You see it? So I'm looking, and I'm like, wait a minute. There's another one. Now, wait, wait, and here's another. And I'm looking, I'm, so I, I photographed this from every angle that I could. This is sitting at the top of it. Uh, the, right now, they've got them laid flat. But you see this geometric line. This yes. is straight. You have to see it in person, right? There, this angle, this goes down. It's angled and then comes back across. But if you take a really close look, there's a key lock. You see it? Yeah. Right? And it's usually, another one. those are usually found on the top of the structures. So is there something underneath that? I, I, I don't. I, this was locked together with metal. Yeah. You know, and this is before the Bronze Age. I mean, it, it's like, wait a minute. What? How? How is this happening here? And nobody wants to bring up this point. These these were giant blocks that were locked together with metal. Now, I don't know if they poured the metal in, right? I don't know. Um, and you can see here there's something intentional that's carved. There um, it needs to be, this is Puma Punku, and there needs to be some more investigation here. There. Don't they have the exact same thing in Egypt and Baalbek and in Lebanon? And yeah, uh, they have the they same do. exact thing. Yeah, yeah, the same type of uh, construction of uh, interlocking stones. There's another one there. Go, they, you know uh, what? It, I sent you. I sent you an image that will explain this. Um, I don't know if you want to bring that up. But, but there's one more image left that I sent you. It's called the Manette or Manette. Okay, I'll from, pull it up right from now. Dendera. Oh, it's from Dendera. Yes. Now, uh, again, this is Puma Punku. We always talk about the H blocks. Yes. You just walk around and it's just sitting here like this. Look at that. It's just like, it's just like, what? Right, and it's just piles of, just piles of the craziest. You know, look at this right here. Look, look, look. Oh, see these, yeah. see the see see this. Look, and it's just sitting there. Nobody's paying attention to it. Look what's going on in the background here. All right, and and I'm walking by, and I couldn't. Oh, there you go. This is what I was looking for. Look at this. Look. Just sitting there, dude. It's just sitting. Look at the size of this. It, uh, by the way, um, 
uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm guessing this is six feet by four feet, right? This, look, look, this giant thing just sitting, sticking out of the ground. I don't know how many tons, how many feet or anything, but a, again, here's this same repetitive. Yeah. Uh, you also, gate. you also see this in, um, central, central America and, uh, T gates like this are actually found in America. Um, so this is a, like I said, this is a worldwide phenomena um, based on symbolism, but it's also based on on math and geometry and how it relates to the movement of the heavens and the earth. Um, it's a very advanced system, very advanced knowledge. And just by looking at it, you know, we may not see it because we don't understand how smart our ancestors were. <laughs> They're geniuses. Yeah. yeah. I'll get to your image in a second. This sure. is uh, part of uh, Pumapunku is a big square. And so it's probably a quarter of a mile on each side. This is just like one corner. Um, and I'm just walking down just, you see, see how it's ginormous. So this is the base. This is coming around. The H blocks are over here uh, around the hill. So you come down here, you go down here, and, and you, you walk this entire length. And this is all megalithic, ancient. You know, and, and there's no ar archaeologist there. There's nobody doing anything. It's just sitting there. And look at look how magnificent it is. And it's, you know, it's 10,000 years old. And you just walk and walk and walk and walk. So you get down here to the end, and that's a corner. You turn and you go down the backside, <laughs> and you go more and more. And and here, this is uh, there's probably a, a quarter of a mile of of this. It's hundreds of yards of of carved stones. I'm just walking, taking pictures, and then there's this staircase down here at the end. And look at the how old do you think this actually is? Right? This is new, right? Yes. That's the old staircase. Look at this. Yeah. And that's what they find a lot at these sites is that there is ancient construction and then there's like new construction or renovations uh, fixing it up for the next culture or the next time period. Okay, let's get to your image. What did you just send me? Manette. Oh, it's in the the file that I sent you. It's uh, Manette. Uh, what? What? When did you send it? Oh no, no, it's in the original folder. I sent it to you. Oh, oh, it's in the original folder. Yeah. Okay, which one? Manette. Oh, Manette. Got it. Yeah. So this is at uh, Dendera, the Temple of Dendera. So this is called the Minette Relief at Dendera. And Minette is a necklace. So this is the necklace um, that is connected to the goddess Hathor. And so that's uh, an image of Hathor on the pillars. You have the four pillars of Hathor. And on top of her head, um, you have the gates. The gates. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so and and remember, Dendera is um, dated to um, um, 50 BC. So it's more of like the New Kingdom of of Egypt. So this is later on, and you can see that it has the gates of of the gods, uh, which is the Sumerian theme of the gates of the gods. You have the Minette. She is the Minette symbol, which is a, a necklace with a counterbalance on the top. And you can see these ropes connected to uh, the top of each um, gate of the gods. If you count the knots on these ropes, mm -hmm. it comes to 93 knots combined. It takes 93 days from uh, the spring equinox to move into the summer solstice. It takes 93 days and they have 93 knots. You have the boat with the sun on it going into the Western horizon because she is the goddess of the Western horizon. 
So you have the sun boat. If you measure, the sun is at exactly at 23.5 degrees. The base of the minette from that point is 15 degrees. And if you connect all these lines to the ropes, to the base, it's exactly 23.5 degrees. So this is just another way. And, in, and you have the four pillars, which is the four pillars of creation. This is all symbology. All has to do with the movement of the sky, the sun through the gates. They were, they were, and this is also the temple that has the Dendera lights, mm -hmm. which again, um, I, I detail in this book. Um, it will, it will show you what the Dendera lights actually mean. Um, and remember, it's not me telling you what it means. It's the architects showing you through geometry what their purpose was, you know? So, um, all these themes, all these motifs, all these symbols, they have mystical meanings. They have astrological meanings. They were designed with a very specific intention. So you have hieroglyphs, for example, that tell a story, right? Um, you have a written language, uh, Sumerian cuneiform numbering systems language, but there is a completely other language in symbology that has not been tapped into that people don't understand and it's based on sacred geometry and very specific numbers and in the book uh, the gates of the anunnaki um, i list all of the numbers show you how they connect to every part of heaven and earth how the ancients use the numbers to create their images their artifacts their idols their gods and the myths that are associated with those gods and images relate to the geometry that they represent. So this is a whole other ball game, I think. And this is why I stay up at night. This is why I can't sleep because I know that we've just opened a door to something new um, that will change history. It will really change history because if what I'm showing is actually correct, which I have hundreds of examples of, it means that this knowledge goes back to the last, last ice age. They knew how to, they knew the movements of the stars, movements of the planets, scales of the earth, scales of the moon, scales of the sun, different dimensions and angles that we believe we figured out recently. And if this is correct, which I'm, I'm hundred percent convinced now that this is not a coincidence, that this is very deliberate and it is a language. It's a lost language. And in the book, I talk about how this could be the lost language of Babylon. You know, the tower of Babel is, you know, they had one language that uh, basically allowed them to um, do anything they put their minds to because they all spoke one language. And then after the flood, you know, they were displaced to around the planet and now they have different languages, but they never lost the original language. It was just not, it's not something, it's not a language that we understand. It's a language of the stars. It's a language of geometry and the numbers of creation, which is so unbelievably profound that you you can't even look at reality the same anymore. My reality is completely tossed <laughs> because you see you can't. That's uh, that's my point, Jason. Yeah, you got it. You got to take some time off. I, I told you, man. You got to leave the house. <laughs> Come out here with Monica. Hang out with me. Disconnect. Unplug from the matrix for a little bit. And and get back to just enjoying the world for for what it is. It's yeah. still it's still it, snowing where I am. Yeah. Jason drives down the road, and and Monica's like, "Oh man, that's a, that looks like a pretty good restaurant." Yeah, it's twenty three and a half degrees <laughs> to the right. You know, you got you got to disconnect, man. You got to yeah, you got to you got to go back and look at like you know, see this picture, see my shirt. Yes, yes. The headphones? Yes. 
or 23 and a half degrees to the eyes. Yes. No, just I'm just kidding, like that I'm movie. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to say that, you know, um, I know like Astral Genesis, that book, Astral Genesis, it was a lot based on the numbers 23.5, but the new book, Gates of the Anunnaki, it's really based on a numbering system that we really didn't jump into too much because I really want people to. I, I want people to get the book. And yeah. it, 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 and so what, what Jason uh, said to me and, and Bill and John aside, if you guys could uh, get the links up again, I have them in social media too, as well. We're about to wrap the show. Um, when I, I went back, I was like on my third read of the book. And and Jason goes, uh, he had called me up and said, man, it's it's the king's list, man. It's the king's. And I just had to just go back and just like absorb exactly what's going on here. But when you when you see the the same numbers repeated over and over again, not not in a, a, a year or a specific period of time for millennia. You know, and, and and I would strongly suggest that this goes back uh, not just four, five, six, seven, eight thousand years, but but hundreds of thousands of years. And who taught who first? Where did this information come from? And I, I think that's the big ask, right? Everything is taught. Everything is taught. Just like Jason is teaching you. With this book, the ancients preserved this and to teach Jason. And somebody taught them, right, to preserve it. And that is just the basis of everything. Everything is taught. So go, get Gates of the Anunnaki, get Astral Genesis, read the books. It, it, it will profoundly change you. So, Jason, just thank you, man, for being for being who you are, man. you Thank are you. able, you are able to see things and, and turn around and teach us, my brother. I really appreciate it. And uh, congratulations on not only uh, the release of the book, but the success of the book. I think this book will transcend time and it will change things, my friend. Thank you so much, Jimmy. And thanks for the influence and pushing me as well. Cause you know, it's uh it comes out when we just, go back and forth like this i'll be your muse anytime brother now get out here okay with monica and let's go and, and visit my desert okay sounds great i'll talk to you jason quit everybody perfect friday night i'll talk to you my friend jason quit now crystal sun is below the links for the book are throughout social media. We've got it in the chat, all of my social media. You can go to the Crystal Sun, uh, and, and you can also head straight to Amazon and look up Jason Quit. It is right there. What a fantastic show. Now, I am officially going to start my weekend with what? What am I doing tonight? I'm doing what Jason's about to go and do. Three-body problem. That's right. Three body problem. It's Friday night. There you go. Head to Netflix after you order Jason's book from Amazon. I've got three more episodes to go. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Thank you, everybody. What a what a great show tonight. I love it. Maybe we should do more Friday nights. Yeah. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. What Masters Drew the Geek? Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody on Monday. Have a great, safe weekend. Until then, go back, Lee Tappy.